When researching ancient Egypt, one can be taken down all sorts of rabbit holes concerning this ancient society's beliefs, history, and archaeology. In order to highlight some of these, I've created this iceberg diagram which we will explore together. For those who've never watched an iceberg video, the entries near the tip of the iceberg are mostly common knowledge. As we descend further down, the topics become more obscure and mysterious. Sources for the claims made in this video will be located in the description, and if you would like to hear more about any of these topics, leave a comment and let me know. Pyramid's Original Look This entry refers to the fact that the Pyramids of Giza, no doubt the most famous monuments in all of Egypt, had a very different appearance in antiquity. Today what one sees is actually the inner limestone core. The pyramids were once covered in a much smoother fine white limestone which would have gleamed in the brightness of the Egyptian sun. The Pyramid of Khafra, the second largest at Giza, actually preserves some of its outer limestone casing near the top. Over time these outer layers were stripped for stone to be used in building elsewhere. The pyramids were also originally topped with a capstone known as a pyramidion. These may have also been made of limestone or harder stone like granite or basalt or even electrum or gold. The original appearance of these monuments had to have been absolutely awe-inspiring, emphasizing the king's transcendent divinity and solar connections. It was aliens. Speaking of the pyramids, these monuments are so impressive that some have come to believe they could only have been built with extraterrestrial assistance. This idea originates with the Swiss author Erich von Däniken, whose claims are universally regarded as pseudo-historical and pseudo-scientific. Ultimately, ancient alien theories stem from white supremacy and the Western disbelief in the idea that an ancient African civilization could be capable of such incredible architectural feats. Cleopatra's Suicide Cleopatra VII Philopater famously had a close relationship with the Roman dictator Julius Caesar. However, after the latter's assassination, she sided with the general Mark Antony, who was defeated by Octavian in the Battle of Actium in 31 BCE. As the political and military situation grew worse for the couple, Cleopatra sequestered in her tomb and sent a message to Antony that she had committed suicide. Out of despair, Antony committed suicide by stabbing himself in the stomach. Cleopatra, along with two of her servants, took her own life as well. Ancient authors gave different explanations for how she did so. Her personal physician provided no information, and the popular belief that she allowed herself to be bitten by an asp or Egyptian cobra comes from Plutarch, while Dio Cassius claims she injected the poison with a needle, and Strabo, who is the earliest source, argues either for a snake bite or the application of a poisonous ointment. While no snake was found with her body, there were apparently puncture wounds on her arm which may have been caused by a needle. The Library of Alexandria This library was no doubt the most famous in all antiquity, drawing scholars from across the Hellenistic world to study and write treatises on subjects ranging from astronomy and magic to epic poems and history. However, the idea that the Great Library ended dramatically with the conflagration is a modern misconception. The decline of the library really began in the mid-2nd century BCE when Ptolemy VIII Fiscon expelled many scholars from the institution. Around a hundred years later, during the Siege of Alexandria, Julius Caesar was forced to set fire to his own ships in harbor. Cassius Dio reports that storehouses of grain and books, said to be great in number and of the finest, were burned. Some scholars believe this is referring to a warehouse outside of the library which was meant to hold scrolls, or that only part of the library was destroyed. No matter the extent of the devastation, the library continued to exist at least until 272 CE, during the reign of the Emperor Aurelian, who destroyed much of that quarter of the city in which the library was located. If the library survived this attack, it was most likely destroyed only 20 years later during the Emperor Diocletian's siege of Alexandria in 297 CE. Whenever the library came to its final end, it is evident that the building was not reduced to ashes because of the carelessness of Caesar. Rather, disuse and neglect over centuries, paired with authoritarian violence, eventually extinguished the intellectual lighthouse present in Alexandria. Animal Mummies It's well known that the ancient Egyptians practiced mummification on domesticated cats, as they were considered sacred and were beloved pets to many, but countless other non-human animals were mummified as well. Examples include mummified birds, monkeys, bulls, fish, crocodiles, and even scarab beetles. Although some were embalmed and entombed along with their owner to act as pets in the hereafter, many others were ritually sacrificed and offered to the god they were believed to be a symbol of. Cats, for instance, were offered to the goddess Bastet, and ibises to the god Thoth. Many temples had an enterprise in raising animals for the sole purpose of ritually killing and mummifying them so they could be sold to pilgrims who would offer them to the appropriate deity. 
In other cases, like with the Apis bull, the individual animal itself was believed to be divine and would be carefully mummified and buried with great respect. The Mummy's Curse this last century refers to the superstition that ancient Egyptian tombs were protected with magical curses which can inflict harm on anyone who enters or disturbs them. In reality, very few tombs in the archaeological record preserve such curses. This belief rose in popularity after the opening of Tutankhamun's tomb in 1922, when the financer of the excavation, Lord Carnarvon, died of blood poisoning four months after the tomb was opened. In fact, of the 58 people present when the tomb and sarcophagus were opened, only eight died within a dozen years. Europeans ate mummies. The naturally occurring mixture of hydrocarbons known as bitumen was used in architecture and medicine for thousands of years. The substance is viscous when heated but hardens when dried, allowing it to be used in stabilizing broken bones. The ancient Roman naturalist Pliny the Elder even recommended ingesting bitumen with other liquids to treat various ailments. Natural bitumen is abundant in the Middle East and different societies had their own names for it. The Persian word for the substance was mummia, and when Europeans first saw the embalmed bodies of ancient Egyptians which were coated in a black resin, they called them mummies. By the Middle Ages in Europe, the healing properties of bitumen were believed to be possessed by the mummies themselves, leading to their preserved flesh being ground up and consumed even though the material wasn't actually used on most of them. The majority of mummies which came to Europe in fact belonged to Greeks and Romans of later periods, not pharaohs as some assume them to be. The exoticism of Egypt likely played a part in the appeal of this strange medicinal practice. Over time, however, demand waned and the overall popularity of so-called corpse medicine fell dramatically. Though this fad undoubtedly seems very strange to modern observers, the belief in the sacred power of human flesh and the transferal of life force is a very ancient one, and is reflected in the Christian belief in the holiness of the bones of saints and the ritual of the Eucharist. Sphinx Water Erosion Hypothesis this entry refers to a hypothesis put forward by the geologist at Boston University, Robert Schock. He contends that the erosion visible on the walls of the Sphinx enclosure could have only been caused by rainfall, and also that the Giza Plateau hasn't experienced significant rainfall since the early 3rd millennium BCE. If both of these proposals are true, then the Great Sphinx must be over 1,000 years older than is currently believed, predating Egyptian civilization itself. Some have gone so far as to claim that this structure is over 11,500 years old, built by a lost, high-tech civilization. However, this hypothesis is not accepted by the majority of archaeologists and Egyptologists. Firstly, the erosion was not necessarily caused by rainfall beating down on the enclosure walls. Some experts believe that the visible erosion took place before the Sphinx was carved, as water seeped through natural fissures in the limestone. Others point to the geological process of haloclasty, where condensed dew on the walls draws salt crystals out of the rock, which then expand and cause parts of the limestone surface to flake off. In fact, the Sphinx is currently experiencing rapid erosion because of this very process. Second, even if the erosion was caused by rainfall, recent geoarchaeological evidence suggests that the Giza Plateau was experiencing heavy rains until the end of the Old Kingdom. There have even been downpours at Giza in recent decades. However, simply looking at the big picture shows how unlikely this hypothesis really is. For instance, the southern wall of the Sphinx enclosure aligns with the angle of Khafre's Causeway built in the 4th dynasty. Robert Shaw claims that this enclosure wall must have been extended in later times, but that very wall shows the erosion that he claims could only have been caused by rainfall in prehistoric times. Looking at the even bigger picture, we can realize that we know what Egyptians were up to before the Sphinx was built. There is no evidence of a lost, advanced, prehistoric civilization, but there is lots of evidence showing how the Egyptians were living in a time before the pharaohs, which I have already made a video covering. The Sphinx's Head A related hypothesis to the previous one supposes that the head of the Great Sphinx, believed by most Egyptologists to represent the pharaoh whose pyramid the Sphinx guards, Khafre, or possibly his predecessor Jedifra, actually replaced an earlier sculpted head. This is thought to simply have taken the form of a lion or possibly even a jackal head, making the Sphinx a representation of the god Anubis. This idea is based on the fact that the Sphinx's head seems to be too small for its body. However, this sculpture is both the earliest and largest sphinx in Egypt, and perhaps the Egyptians were not quite used to planning and carving such a monument with the precision they would later become famous for. Dr. Mark Lehner, a leading expert on the archaeology of the Giza Plateau, has argued that the head simply looks too small in relation to the length of the body, which had to be elongated by the builders to complete the latter part of the sphinx due to a natural fissure that is present in the bedrock. Otherwise, the sphinx's body would appear to be far too small in relation to the head, creating an even more awkward appearance. The Dendera Light Bulb In the upper Egyptian city of Dendera, there is an amazingly well-preserved temple complex with shrines to several important Egyptian deities. 
In the Shrine of Hathor, there is a scene carved in bas-relief which has drawn a peculiar amount of attention, as some have hypothesized that this is a depiction of an ancient Egyptian light bulb. This idea, once again, was first suggested by von Däniken. In his 1996 book, Die Augen des Sphinx, he describes this scene as having what can easily be imagined as a bulb, with a socket and a wire leading to a junction box and insulator, while a baboon with knives symbolizes the danger of electricity. However, this is simply a wild misinterpretation, as the scene is really a depiction of the Egyptian creation myth. The surrounding hieroglyphic inscriptions make this clear. Speaking the words of Harsamtis, the great god who dwells in Dendera, who emerges out of the lotus flower as a living Ba, whose completeness is elevated by the Kamachu images of his Ka, whose Sashemu image is revered by the crew of the day barge, whose body is carried by the Jed Pillar. Harsamtis, another name for Horus, is depicted as a snake encapsulated by what the texts call a hem container of the night barge, which emerges from a lotus flower. The so-called wire is actually a flat-bottomed Nile barge, and the Jed Pillar, a common symbol representing strength and stability, holds up the newly born god. Moreover, the baboon is not a symbol of the danger of electricity, but is a guardian demon. The inscription next to him reads, Your name is perfect as Wepwe, your face is that of a toad. I have slaughtered your enemies with a knife, and I will follow your opponent in the place of execution. Once again, looking at the bigger picture, if the ancient Egyptians possessed light bulbs, we would find some of their remains, like metal sockets and filaments, in the archaeological record. Helicopter Hieroglyphs Speaking of misinterpreting hieroglyphic inscriptions, one carving from the Temple of Seti I at Abydos has been hypothesized to represent a helicopter and two other flying objects that resemble UFOs. However, this is simply a result of this carved stone being reused over time. The original inscription was carved during the reign of Seti I, reading, He who repulses the nine enemies of Egypt. The carving was later filled in with plaster and recarved during the reign of Ramses II with the title, He who protects Egypt and overthrows foreign countries. This practice of pharaohs reusing old monuments and carving their name over those of their predecessors was extremely common, and especially so during the reign of Ramses II. Over time, the plaster has worn away, leaving both inscriptions partially visible, creating these odd shapes which our modern eyes can interpret as advanced technology. As with the Dendera light bulb, if ancient Egyptians possessed such technology, we would expect to find some evidence of them through archaeology and literature, rather than a single inscription from a lintel at a single temple. When you hear fringe theories like these, just keep in mind the big picture and the maxim that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Dynasty Zero this is another term for the period known as Nakata III, the final stage of the pre-dynastic period, which took place during the 32nd century BCE. It was a time of great importance for the history of Egypt, as provincial rulers or chieftains conquered or united with other principalities, eventually coalescing into a unified Egyptian kingdom. Most evidence of these extremely ancient kings are carved or painted inscriptions of names on clay vessels or ivory tags which often have uncertain readings. The earliest ruler of Upper Egypt whose historical existence is certain is known as King Scorpion, who owned a tomb at Umel Ka'ab in Abydos. Hieroglyphic writing may have begun during his reign as his conquests into Lower Egypt necessitated a record-keeping system. A king crocodile may or may not have followed Scorpion. The only evidence for the existence of this ruler comes from a few schematic inscriptions of a name, and his tomb is unknown. Following this, we have a ruler more firmly grounded in historical reality. Eri Hor was also buried at Abydos, where dozens of inscriptions of his name have been found. In 2012, an inscription mentioning Eri Hor was found in the Sinai Peninsula. This text also speaks of Memphis, pushing back the founding of that city to before Egypt's unification. The tomb that follows Eri Hor's in a sequential order belongs to a ruler alternatively called Ka, or Sekin, based on the orientation of the hieroglyph in his name. He was succeeded by Scorpion II, who some Egyptologists believe is simply another name for Narmer. Alternatively, Narmer may have conquered King Scorpion's domain while unifying Egypt, thus beginning the First Dynasty. Overall, the current picture of so-called Dynasty Zero is hazy, but this area of study is seeing a lot of action in the field of Egyptology. Senenmut Senenmut was a man who lived during the Egyptian 18th dynasty. Born as a commoner, he would enter into royal service probably during the reign of Thutmose II, but would rise starkly in prominence under the regency and reign of Hatshepsut. He was given the title High Steward of the King and oversaw Hatshepsut's many building projects, including her mortuary temple at Deir al-Bakri. But most popular attention around Senenmut is focused on his possible relationship with Hatshepsut. Behind one of the main doors of her mortuary temple, Hatshepsut allowed Senenmut to carve his name and an image of himself, a very strange privilege for a commoner. Moreover, Senenmut was a tutor to Hatshepsut's daughter Neferura, and never seems to have married or had children himself, again very unusual for an official of his standing. 
Rumors about a possible affair between the two also seem to have existed at the time, as graffiti in an unfinished tomb used as a rest house for the workers at Hatshepsut's mortuary temple shows a man and a hermaphroditic figure with pharaonic regalia engaging in an explicit act. We'll likely never know the truth about these theories, but Senenmut was undeniably an incredibly interesting historical figure, and his story shows the social mobility that characterized the Egyptian New Kingdom. Ramses III Assassination the Turin Judicial Papyrus, composed in the 12th century BCE, records the trials held against conspirators who plotted to assassinate Ramses III. During his reign, Egypt was in a state of decline caused by the late Bronze Age collapse which toppled many surrounding powers. One of the king's wives, Queen Tai, orchestrated the conspiracy to place her own son, Pentawerit, on the throne instead of Ramses' intended heir, Amener Kepshef. The Judicial Papyrus revealed that over three trials, 28 people were sentenced to death and 10 were forced to commit suicide in court. The fourth and fifth trials led to two judges having their noses and ears cut off for cavorting with some of the accused women. The court documents give no indication that the plot succeeded, but in 2011, a German forensic team reinspected the mummy of Ramses III. They pointed out that there were excessive bandages around the neck, and a CT scan revealed that the king's throat had been slit with a knife deep enough to reach the vertebrae. It was also discovered that Ramses' left big toe had been severed with no signs of bone healing, meaning the injury likely occurred shortly before death. The pharaoh must have been attacked by multiple conspirators with different weapons, and although his injuries were lethal, the plot failed to replace his designated heir, as Amener Kepshef would indeed inherit his father's throne and become Ramses IV. The Sea Peoples Speaking of Ramses III, in his mortuary temple at Medinet Habu near modern-day Luxor, there are multiple inscriptions describing an attack on Egypt in the eighth year of his reign. One of these records that the foreign countries made a conspiracy in their islands. All at once the lands were removed and scattered in the fray. Their confederation was the Peleset, Tejekar, Shekelesh, Denyan, Shardana, and Weshesh, lands united. This coalition sent a fleet towards the mouth of the Nile, where they were ambushed by Ramses' forces. Since this group apparently came from islands across the Mediterranean and attacked with fleets of ships, historians have come to refer to them as the Sea Peoples. This was not their first attempt to invade Egypt. About 30 years earlier, during the reign of Merneptah, so-called foreign peoples of the sea attacked under the leadership of a Libyan king. During this period, around the 12th century BCE, many sites across the eastern Mediterranean show evidence of destruction. Mycenae and Knossos in Greece, Troy and Hattusae in Anatolia, Ugarit in Syria, and many others. This era of chaos is referred to as the Late Bronze Age Collapse. The fact that many of these cities show direct evidence of being attacked has led many to believe the so-called sea peoples were responsible. More recent studies have come to question the idea that these bands of raiders could have been enough to cause the collapse of massive empires all on their own. As for who these people even were, scholars have several ideas for most of the groups mentioned in the Egyptian texts. The Peleset are widely regarded as being the Philistines, enemies of the Israelites in the Hebrew Bible. The Denyan and Ekwesh have been equated with the Danaeans and Achaeans, peoples of Greece mentioned in the Homeric epics, while the Shekelesh and Shardana probably came from Sicily and Sardinia near Italy. The Sea Peoples are a huge object of debate in academic circles, and if you'd like to learn more, I can recommend these two YouTube videos which cover the topic more thoroughly.